you know, so, so skilled people earn much less than they would do that in, a, in, a, in, a, in a competitive labor market. So not everybody benefits. I'm just trying to get across the idea that institutional variation seems to be caused by different outcomes of this political process, okay, and different preferences are uh, represented in the structure of institutions. That's, that's, I said this was an idiosyncratic personal view. Okay, so, so you know, why do institutions vary? And here, you know, the, here I just, you know, when I think about this, what I, what I tend to see in the world is I tend to see relatively little response to things like crises or shocks or things like that. I see a lot of persistence. So a lot of my own research has been sort of focused on trying to understand, you know, the emergence of world inequality over the last 200, 300 years and trying to understand these very long-run patterns of economic divergence. And, and what I see, you know, when I look at the world is enormous persistence in institutions. Okay, so for example, I haven't got time to talk about this in any detail, but if you wanted me to talk about, you know, why does the Americas look like it does? You know, why, why is Canada and the United States rich, richer than, you know, Mexico or Colombia? And why is, you know, Paraguay or, you know, Guatemala or Haiti much poorer than those countries? That's, to me, you know, if you want to understand that, 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 that fact, you have to start by understanding how political economic institutions were formed during the colonial period and how those institutions have propagated themselves over time. And that's a, so that's a very kind of slow moving, uh, long run uh, process. And you know, what I want to emphasize, you know, to, to, to start, to, you know, why I emphasize that is, well, think about financial crises and immediately start thinking about Latin America, okay? Argentina, you know, uh, but, there's been, you know, if I went back a hundred, if I thought about, if I ranked economic institutions in the Americas today, and I thought about who had, you know, the most secure property rights, or who was the most, if I thought about political institutions, which countries are the most democratic, and I went back a hundred years, the ranking would be almost identical. You have the same countries at the top, same countries in the middle, same countries at the bottom. There's some sort of enormously persistent process driving institutional development in the Americas, and that's been very immune to uh, the impact of crises, okay? So this is, so I'm, I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, you, know, not, you know, I sort of have this very historical way of thinking about these things. And so, you know, when, I think if you think more historically about the processes that, you know, shape the way the world looks today, I, I don't, you know, so my, I'm, I'm in a minority of one probably, but, you know, when the crisis came, my, my expectation was this was gonna have no impact on anything. So I don't know if I'm right, going to be right or not, but you know, uh, so uh, that's, that's, I'm just trying to give you a sense of where that's coming from. So my own kind of sense is that, you know, there's no rethink about capitalism, uh, not in the United States, maybe in Europe, you know, people are more interested in thinking about that. But, but you know, and, 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 and also, you know, I, as I said earlier, you know, the sort of political way, political economy way of thinking about this says, well, you know, you don't, don't think about rethinking institutions. Think about, you know, reforming power relations in society or think about the political equilibrium changing. That's what it would take to change institutions. After all, what changed institutions in South Africa? Well, it was a sort of revolt from below. It was a revolution. It was a change in power relations in society at the, to, at the expense of white people to the benefit of black people. It wasn't that white people woke up one day and thought, oh my God, you know, capitalism in South Africa, what a terrible system. We need to introduce a different model. No, that wasn't what happened at all. So, so, so you know, okay. So that's my first point. What about globalization? What about the impact of globalization on institutions? So I think, you know, I think that crisis could have an effect on uh, on, on, on institutions, but my sense is that there's a, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot, a lot of forces, uh, uh, working against that. What about globalization? Uh, you know, when I think about globalization and the impact of globalization on institutions, I go back to a paper that the great British economic historian M. M. Poston pu published in 1939 in the Economic History Review called The Rise of the Money Economy. And Poston was asking, what was the impact of international trade on serfdom and feudal institutions? And the answer to that was, it depends. So Poston pointed out these examples where 
the rising commercial economy and globalization in the late medieval period had led to the decline of feudalism and the spread of market relations and improved economic efficiency. And he also pointed out an example in Eastern Europe where commercialization had led to an intensification of serfdom and a decline in, you know, you might say a sort of deterioration in economic institutions. So I could give you more historical examples, but I don't have time to talk about it. So I think, I think the, the impact of globalization on institutions is also, so I've always thought it would be kind of hideously simplistic, this idea that somehow globalization leads to convergence of institutions, since there's so many historical examples where, diver, where globalization leads to divergence of institutions. So I was going to illustrate that with an example from late 19th century Latin America, but I don't have time to talk about John Coatsworth, as a distinguished historian, wrote about this. I don't have time to talk about Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid anyway, but my jokes are not very funny, so, so we'll leave that for another time. Uh, so, 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 you know, is, is, any of this, is any of this contempt, you know, any kind of contemporary relevance? Well, I, I wanted to make an analogy between 19th century Latin, globalization in 19th century Latin America and globalization today. You know, here's a possible scenario for the impact of globalization on institutions in sub-Saharan Africa. What happened in 19th century Latin America was transportation costs fell, communications improved. Suddenly, it became profitable to export all of these you know, commodities from, from Mexico and Central America and South America. Land became valuable, suddenly. What happened when land became value? Political elites went around expropriating the land because it was suddenly valuable. Okay, so that led to an enormous amount of conflict. It led to a huge increase in inequality. There was institutional change. It led to change in state institutions. Institutional change occurred in a very path-dependent uh, way. Difficult to think of it as being kind of institutional convergence in any sense. You can think of something very similar happening uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's very similar uh, to what happened in 19th century Latin America. I just you know, just let me give you one thing which is sort of fun. There's plenty of examples of perverse globalization in sub-Saharan Africa. Here's my famous example, which is from a paper by Massimo Guidolin and Eliana LaFerrara, which is the impact of peace in Angola on the share prices of diamond companies. So uh, this is on the left-hand side, this, the, the vertical line is the date when they, when they finally signed a peace deal, the MPLA and UNITA. This is after Savimbi died in Angola. And you can see that the left-hand side is essentially excess returns of uh, diamond mining companies which were invested in Angola. Civil war was very good for diamond, the profits of diamond mining companies in Angola. And you can see, you know, this is the control group. This is on the right-hand side. That's diamond mining companies not invested in Angola. So, you know, chaos is, chaos is you know, in Africa, it makes, it's good for profits of diamond mining companies. So I just, you know, just, give you an, just to give you an example of, you know, global, it seems to me the impact of globalization on institutions is sort of much more complicated than the kind of image that people have of sort of forces towards convergence. And, and maybe that's because, as Devesh was sort of implying, this literature on the varieties of capitalism is very kind of focused on Western democracies. And, you know, and I, I, you know it seems to me a lot of the intuitions don't, don't, don't really travel into different contexts. Okay, so let me just wrap up now. I'm probably hideously over, am I? Yes, this lady's polite, too polite. Okay, so I, I you know, so, 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 so I'm just trying, I don't have enough time here to talk really properly about the political economy approach to understanding institutional variation, but I try to give you some sense of how I would kind of approach this issue of the variety of institutions. Of course, institutions vary a lot. I think this notion of, you know, many ways is, is sort of correct in the sense that, you know, there are different sets of specific institutions which generate similar level of prosperity and have other consequences that you might care about. But what's the policy conclusion of that? I don't know. I mean, you know, what's the policy conclusion of um, authoritarianism in China is consistent with rapid economic growth? There's never, to my knowledge, been a developmental dictatorship in sub-Saharan Africa or anywhere in Latin America or Central America. So what, you know, Devesh himself pointed out that the Communist Party was a very unique institution. They don't have anything like the Chinese Communist Party in Sierra Leone or Colombia. So, so you know, so what, what conclusion do I draw from that? You know, to, 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 to draw a conclusion about, you know, about how one set of institutions would function in a different environment my sense would be you have, to understand, you have to understand very well the kind of political equilibrium of that society and the types of political forces which would determine how those institutions would work. 
So I, you know, this way of thinking, it's, you know, it sort of makes it, I'm just trying to kind of up, you know, emphasize here that if you, you know, to, to propose alternative institutional recipes, you have to understand very well the way the politics, work, the, way, the way politics works.